I'm not sure that this conversation could be better timed, quite frankly. Um, you know, this is a conversation that uh, um, as we go through this next iteration of the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, it has just become incredibly clear, I think, to the public of how essential the immigrant workforce is uh, to the nation's response and recovery to COVID-19. Um, but it's also incredibly important, a well-timed uh, conversation because of what's happening uh, on the Hill and here in Washington, DC. So at this point you have you know, Democrats in the House, Democrats in the Senate working in the White House to try to uh, um, get legal protections for uh, the undocumented essential workforce. In fact, it could happen over the course of this webinar where the parliamentarian could give the thumbs up or the thumbs down uh, to extending humanitarian parole to a popular to a segment of that population uh, uh, to five year uh, kind of renewable periods. Um, so I think the the movement on the hill is very much due to the fact of the leadership of the immigrant community, but also to the leadership of organizations uh, um, like the Immigrant Learning Center, but also. Uh, um, you know, just the, the the importance of the research that's being done and, and all of us on this call uh, um, being a part of these conversations. So um, I'm really looking forward to learning more about what the, the findings are from uh, the authors of the report. Um, like Denzel said, we're going to, you know, hear through, hear about what's happening, uh, hear about the report itself, and then we'll go into a moderated uh, Q&A. Um, I would ask you, I'd urge you, please put the, your questions or comments in the chat. I will do my darndest to keep track of that. Um, although, you know, you think after uh, uh, the amount of Zoom conversations that we've all been on, I would be better at it than I am. Uh, but please be patient with me. And if I missed your question, uh, feel free to put it back up there again, and I'll try to grab it and, and drop it into the conversation as we go. But again, the, the important part of this conversation is that, uh, about this presentation is that the, the essential nature of the immigrant workforce and what it means to economies at a local level, much less our national uh, economy. And then how do we translate what we're learn, going to learn today into advocacy strategies, again, locally at a state level or even nationally. So uh, enough of me jabbering on, let's um, go and dig into the actual findings of the report. So joining us from Minneapolis, Minnesota is Anuradha Sajanyar. Uh, she is the lead researcher of the report, uh, Immigrant Essential Workers During COVID-19 Pandemic. Dr. Sajanyar is a postdoc fellow in policy and governance at Australian National University. And as a social researcher, she works closely with interpretive research methods and engages with a broad range of stakeholders and audiences to create meaningful work in public policy. It is such a pleasure to have you today, and um, thank you for joining us, but just as importantly, thank you so much for your work and being the lead author on this report. So let me turn it over to you all, and then we will flip to the discussion um, afterwards. Um, thank you so much, everybody, for being here. It's uh, It was really a pleasure to do this work, and it feels, as um, as has already been mentioned, incredibly you know pertinent and timely. Um, so just kind of to start out with, I'll give a brief overview of what the aims of the project were and how um, I went about doing it. Um, so just to start, what is essential industry? Uh, the COVID emergency presented itself as a stress test on systems crucial to the country's functioning and well-being. On March 19th, 2020, the Department of Homeland Security developed a list of essential critical infrastructure workers to, as it shows on the screen, help officials as they work to protect their communities while ensuring continuity of functions critical to public health and safety, as well as economic and national security. Um, the list included industries pertaining to medical and healthcare telecommunications, information technology systems, defense, food and agriculture, transportation, logistics, energy, water, wastewater, law enforcement, and public works. The pandemic not only revealed their weaknesses, but brought into stark relief how important our essential workers are in growing our food, keeping our stores open, and being at the front lines of keeping us safe. The oversized contribution of immigrant and foreign-born workers to the US workforce is clear. According to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, foreign-born workers in the US make up 17.4% of the overall labor force in 2019 yet they're vastly overrepresented 
overrepresented in services considered critical. 69% of all immigrants in the US labor force and 74% of undocumented workers are essential workers. As Denzel said through the poll in the beginning, compared to 65% of the native born labor force. Uh, in healthcare, foreign born workers make up 36.3% of home health aides, 28.8% of physicians, and 20.9% of nursing assistants. As with all essential industries, healthcare is highly dependent on undocumented workers who tend to be concentrated in support roles such as nursing assistants and health aides as well as the cleaning and building maintenance positions that keep these medical and care facilities running. In food and agriculture, immigrants also make up 22.0% of all workers in the US food supply chain, including 30.9% of meat processing workers, 26.1% of workers in bakeries, and 59% of animal breeders. In some states, the majority of workers in the food supply chain are immigrants. So given this data, it's unsurprising that foreign born workers were also some of the hardest hit by the, by the pandemic. Essential workers have always been crucial, yet they, are, remain, they remain largely invisible to average consumers of their services. The pandemic made them visible to an extent by bringing national attention to their undervalued services. But while the public may have valued these workers more in the abstract, they didn't better understand their lived experiences. Through an interview-based study of community organizers, immigration policy experts, and immigrant workers in healthcare, retail, and food supply, this report reveals the experiences of immigrant essential workers during the pandemic. It also shows how the lives of these essential workers were impacted by national, state, and community-organized support. We selected California, Minnesota, and Texas as the field sites for this report's interviews because they represent diverse immigrant communities, a high proportion of healthcare, food supply, and retail workers, and also a broad spectrum of political leanings. The report brings attention then to the vital role that immigrants play in the labor market, as well as the need to offer them care and protections. We show how public policies can be improved to benefit immigrant workers, and as a result, the entire country. Our research then asks the following questions. What were the impacts and contributions of immigrant essential workers in selected states and communities in the US? How are the stories found in these places illustrative of larger dynamics in the US during the pandemic? What national, state, and local policies helped or hindered the work of immigrant essential workers? And how did local not-for-profit and advocacy organizations fill in the gaps that these policies left unaddressed? Finally, how do immigrant essential workers see their own role in the pandemic when telling their stories? Um, just a little bit about the methods. To arrange interviews with essential workers, the ILC reached out to community organizations across Minnesota, California, and Texas. And then between May and August of this year, I conducted about 20 semi-structured and in-depth interviews with essential workers across industries, across the states, um, from a variety of countries of origin, and I also conducted 10 interviews with community organizers, policy experts, and employers. Given that this was a research study done during the pandemic itself, the limitations are pretty self-evident, primarily based on access and trust because of COVID. Um, all of the interviews were conducted either by phone or through Zoom, which was helpful but made it challenging to build a sense of trust with interviewees, particularly with more vulnerable populations who are wary of exploitative researchers. For future research studies, we prefer to travel to each state, meet with people in person to collect more in-depth understanding of their lives and experiences. While our sample size is modest, our focus is to conduct in-depth narrative interviews, amplify the voices of immigrant essential workers, and document their impact on national well-being during the pandemic. So as some of the most vulnerable groups in the US, immigrant and refugee communities, along with black, indigenous and other communities of color have been most disproportionately affected by the pandemic. While representing a large share of essential workers, immigrant populations were also more represented in essential sectors that were most prone to layoffs. As such, we present a central policy paradox, um, which was identified in a paper by Kerwin and Warren. 
which says that foreign born workers are deemed essential at very high rates, yet often lack protections, status, and face marginalization by US immigration and COVID related policies. Some of these policy failures include the um, CARES Act, the Pandemic Unemployment Assistance, um, Emergency Food Assistance Program, SNAP, and WIC programs. Rather than legislating more protections for foreign born workers, the Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security Act of 2020 barred immigrant families with an unauthorized family member from receiving a stimulus payment, which meant that 6.2 million essential workers who have 3.8 million US citizen children were ineligible for relief payments. Um, while the second stimulus payment tried to correct this quote unquote mixed status exclusion for households under the CARES Act, 2.2 million children with social security numbers who did not have an eligible taxpayer parent with a social security number remained ineligible. Similarly, the Pandemic Unemployment Assistance Act, which is designed to help independent contractors who can't work during the health crisis, they required work authorization, with, which excluded immigrants. And to receive any of the three stimulus payments, immigrants would have required a valid social security number and work authorization. Even when immigrants are eligible for benefits, fear often prevented them from receiving the help that they needed. Several foreign born workers that I interviewed for this report said they avoided accessing healthcare or other non-cash benefits out of fear of deportation or violating the public charge rule. Now to Denzel for a brief overview of the findings. So we found that um, immigrant essential workers tend to be concentrated in households with other essential workers or have family members who are also essential workers. And if you think about how many uh, first generation immigrant families live, uh, they're often really concentrated already. So that increased the risk for, um, for infection. Um, as you know, many visa programs and green cards were halted during the pandemic, but America still needed its workers. So the H-2B guest worker visa continued. We were still importing foreign labor to work in agriculture and food supply, for instance. In farming and agriculture, there were often little to no work, workplace protections in place. And as Amirara pointed out, um, undocumented workers were particularly vulnerable here, lacking job benefits, and they uh, fared repercussions so that injustices in the workplace, for instance, a lack of uh, sanitation, masks, testing, um, they feared repercussions, so they did not speak up. As you mentioned, the CARES Act included four, more than 14 million people from receiving direct health benefits. And even though health centers, local health centers, for instance, cater to those without status, barriers of misinformation, language access, myths, and fears prevented many from seeking the care that, that they so badly needed. The hero narrative was something that was ascribed to essential workers pretty early on in the pandemic. We remember going out on our balconies and beating pans and saying thank you to healthcare workers. But this quote from someone in food supply says that even when they put thank you posters up, you would see doctors, grocery workers, but you wouldn't see people in a field. I feel like they forgot about the more important people. So many immigrants didn't feel as though the hero narrative applied to them even though they felt a sense of responsibility to their communities. As in this quote from one of the essential workers, most of our clientele who are low income needed to feed their family, so had to cash their checks. We had lines all the way to outside, all the way to 300 feet. It's good for business, but also better for social responsibility to be able to take care of people. We were helping the community. So immigrants took it upon themselves to, to do whatever they could to take care of their communities as vulnerable as they were. All of this uh, was compounded into a mental health toll onto immigrants. So they were already excluded from many programs at the federal level. Uh, other barriers prevented them from accessing local care. And on top of that, as this quote uh, shows, there was a really serious mental health toll on many immigrant families. So this immigrant worker said, I was afraid because my parents had COVID, all my family had COVID. And I was like, if they don't get paid, who's gonna pay the bills? I don't wanna feel like I felt when the pandemic first started. I felt like my family was in a very vulnerable state. 
how did policy respond to this situation over the course of almost two years? So despite heightened attention paid to essential workers, including immigrant essential workers, there was really no meaningful federal policy intervention to provide protection or benefits to immigrant essential workers and their families, particularly undocumented immigrants, who again made up almost three quarters uh, of, of their workforce, almost three quarters are essential. There was activism in certain states, of course, uh, on immigration issues resulting in emergency economic relief and access to health care for immigrants left out or unable to access federal programs. So for instance, California passed 371 COVID-19 related bills. Minnesota passed 280, Texas passed 37. Now, whereas these bills may or may not have been specifically focused on immigrants, they would have affected immigrant workers. So similarly, bills that would have affected immigrant workers would have had an impact on the people, the Americans, uh, that they were providing services for. These include Austin, Texas, where the city council approved a $15 million relief fund uh, for direct aid payments to those excluded from the CARES Act. And that was a direct result of local organizations going to the city council and making these demands, showing them that this, there was this incredible need. Montgomery County, Maryland provided stimulus aid, stimulus aid to immigrants regardless of social security status. 15 states defined testing and treatment for suspected COVID-19 cases as emergency services covered by emergency Medicaid programs, which uh, caters to any resident regardless of status. And this is a very, very important point that uh, resulted from the pandemic, licensing and credentialing. Some states retooled licensing requirements or created programs to more quickly integrate foreign trained essential workers into the labor force to combat the pandemic and fill worker shortages. So for instance, California required licensing boards to speed up licensing procedures for refugees and asylum seekers. The governor of New Jersey authorized the granting of temporary licenses to doctors licensed in foreign countries. This allowed critical worker shortages in areas like healthcare or food supply uh, to be filled when they were needed most, when ICUs were being overwhelmed, when healthcare workers were experiencing burnout uh, all during the pandemic. And this is something that can be applied as a model for other states going forward. So what do we do going forward? The most important overarching point I would say is shifting public discourse on immigration to one, incorporate all essential workers regardless of status and realizing that doing that benefits not just the immigrants, it benefits everyone. So filling critical worker shortages you are taking care of American citizens much better than you would have had those workers not been integrated into the workforce. So the narrative around this needs to change into something that's far more uh, inclusive, showing that what affects immigrants affects Americans as well. Increasing immigrants' access to jobs in essential industries and to, uh, and to occupational or driver's licenses allows more active and safer participation in our collective recovery. It affects everyone. Assuring workers that status does not matter when it comes to access to benefits, that reduces financial health and emotional toll. It takes care of workers and assures them that they can continue to provide critical services to Americans without fear of repercussion. Local government and community partnerships create easier access to health, mental health, and other resources for immigrants. So local governments must be amenable to discussions and partnerships with community organizations, advocacy organizations, and, and the like. And one thing that we discovered in this report, rampant misinformation about every aspect about this uh, pandemic in immigrant communities. So the virus, the vaccine, access to benefits and services. One immigrant from Nigeria recalled receiving a WhatsApp video of a woman who claimed to have had a stroke after receiving the vaccine. This kind of thing slowed our recovery, everyone's recovery. So those community and local government partnerships using trusted sources in immigrant communities to spread the right information is crucial. Getting over language barrier access is crucial. So this is the report that we're launching today. There are many more uh, incredible details in the report. 
and we will be giving you a link to download it soon. 